Let me move now to risk taking. Now the main thing here to think about is that the adolescent brain is really hypersensitive to rewards. And risk taking then is really about that hypersensitivity to rewards. It's more prevalent in adolescents and young adults than it is for any other age group. And I'll point out here, and it's only worse for people who are sleep deprived. So you're even more likely to take risk when you're sleep deprived. So if you compound that with adolescents and young adults who are sleep deprived, then we're really talking about a lot of risk taking going on. What are examples of this kind of risk taking? Like dangerous driving, like texting while they drive, drug use binge drinking, that should have been binge, not bing, um, and risky sexual behavior. Why? Why would this risk taking be more prevalent in adolescents and young adults than any other age group? Well, perhaps it's because of the ventral striatum. Like if you saw in that last lecture, uh, we talked about how Blake Moore had done work on decision making in adolescents versus adults. It could be that the ventral striatum is just so profoundly pumping out you know, responses here that the, that the prefrontal cortex can actually manage that the ventral striatum's need for reward for positive stimulation um, is what drives a lot of that risk taking. So we have that still developing PFC and importantly the lateral PFC which seems to be really important in, in managing you know, our need for reward. So I'm going to give you another example. So I talked about this in the last lecture about how Blakemore has used a driving task. Here's another one. This is Van Horn et al. in 2018. Differential effects of parent and peer presence on neural correlates of risk taking in adolescence. So this one involved only adolescents, early adolescents, people between 12 and 15, 56 of them. And they played what's called the yellow light game while they were in the scanner. Okay, and the goal is that you're going to drive a virtual car through all of the intersections in the shortest amount of time. So they're in the scanner, they got like a little um, button press thing so they can make decisions as they get to different intersections. At each intersection, the driver chooses to go through a yellow light. So there's a yellow light there at the intersection, or they can, so that would be go, go through the yellow light, or they can break and stop and wait for the lights to change again. All right, so it's whether or not you want to blow through those yellow lights or you're going to stop every time you see a yellow light. At about 50% of the time, if you go through that yellow light, another car is going to cross through the intersection and crash into you. And if there is another car and it crashes into the driver, that driver then gets a five second penalty before they can resume again. So you're risking, uh, sure, maybe you'll get through that yellow light and speed through and everything will be fine, but you're also risking that you'll get a five second penalty that will slow down your overall game if you choose to go through a yellow light. And so in this study, these adolescents played the game with either a peer present, so they had another friend of theirs there, or their parent present who is watching them in the scanner, right? So they're not in a scanner themselves, but they're nearby. And so it's either a peer present or a parent that's present. So they're controlling for the fact that there's someone there by having a peer or a parent present. This is an illustration that comes from the article of that uh, yellow light game. And you can see, so you come up to an intersection there up at the top and it's got a yellow light. And so now over there on the left, it's, you could decide to go. If you're successful, you can just speed right through. You're gonna have no delay, but about half the time you're gonna crash into somebody and you're gonna get a five second delay. You could stop. And by the way, if you stop, you're going to have to wait two and a half seconds before the light changes again. If you know, you can see that a car went through that, you're going to go, oh, that was great. I'm glad I stopped because I would have crashed into them. But again, about half the time, there's no one there. So if you stop, it's sort of like an unnecessary stop. And finally, they also had the option that people sometimes would have a no decision. They could decide not to do anything. Um, and in this case, they suffered a one second delay if they didn't actually press the button. They tried to not have that happen as much as possible. They really wanted people to make a go or a stop decision. And then you can see the social context is that you're either doing this with a peer present or you're with your parent. And of course, it's not actually like that in those pictures, but they're in the scanner um, and their, their um, partner is nearby somewhere. All right, so what did they actually find? So we can look here and see two main findings. Um, and so up at the top, we're looking at ventral striatum and the temporal parietal junction, okay? So when participants choose to go through a yellow light, you can see that the ventral striatum and the TPJ were greater in the peer condition. So that's what that's showing us there, is that, that peer versus a baseline is greater. So that means you're getting more ventral striatum activity when they decide to go through a yellow light. 
Um, they don't get as much ventral striatum when they go through yellow light and their parents present. And they also get more TPJ. Remember, this is that kind of mentalizing part of the brain. That's also higher when they decide to go through the yellow light compared to when their parent is present. Now, they could decide to stop at the yellow light. So what about the participants when they stop at a yellow light on those trials, what's going on? And what we can see there is we really get a difference between um, stopping at a yellow light um, is more for the DLPFC. So don't pay attention too much to the fact that the parent baseline is negative. But the real key thing here is to show is that we're getting more DLPFC for these adolescents when they decide to stop at the yellow light and their peer is present. So it's kind of like they have their peer present and you know it's usually rewarding to just blow through there like you can see up at the top. But if they do decide to stop, it's because they're getting more DLPFC, more prefrontal activity to kind of shut down that wanting to get rewarded by blowing through the yellow light. And this is particularly strong when they have a peer present. So the peer matters more than the parent does, obviously, in all these three um, things that you see here in terms of these responses. Uh, that's a really interesting study. And I think, again, it shows you a little bit about the risk taking of adolescents versus adults. A few caveats, though, a few things to think about. First of all, when they looked at the actual behavior of whether they went through the yellow light or not, the behavior didn't show the effects as predicted. There's, they had three conditions, really. They had the alone condition, where you could be by yourself making these decisions. You have a peer condition, where your peer's nearby or your parent's nearby, right? So you would think that based on the data that when the peer was present, they would get the most go decisions, right? They're gonna make these really risky decisions. But in fact, they did this the most when they were alone. So what this shows us is that their behavior didn't fit fit here. They were actually less risky when their peer or their parent was there compared to when they were alone. And no comparison group and age range, and there was no comparison group here. So we don't have adults, we only have adolescents. So we don't know if on this particular task if adults would be different. Um, we also don't have um, much of an age range here. It's a pretty narrow little band of adolescents that we're looking at. So we can't really see how this changes across adolescents in this particular study. Now I'm gonna show you one more study that I think is relevant to all of this. And this is a really interesting study that was done at UQ at the University of Queensland back in 2010 by a PhD student named Richard Rane at that time, who's now um, a professor, I think, at Columbia, and his advisor, Bill Von Hippel, who's still on our staff at UQ. Now, what they did in this study is they, it was, by the way, the title of it is The Presence of an Attractive Woman Elevates Testosterone and Physical Risk Taking in Young Men. It was published in Social, Psychological, and Personality Science. Um, and they had, what they did is they actually went out to Brisbane skateboarding parks to collect their data. So this is a nice field study out there in skateboard parks. And they had a couple independent variables, things that they were actually asking the participants to do. One is they would ask the participants to perform on their skateboard an easy or a difficult trick. And they would just say to the participant, I'd really like you to pick something next that's an easy trick for you. And I don't care what it is, just something that you know you can do like 100% of the time without making a mistake. Or could you do a difficult trick for me, something that maybe about half the time you actually crash and don't actually succeed in performing the trick. The other independent variable was who the experimenter was that was asking the participants to make these tricks. And so you could either have a male experimenter who did it the whole time, or about halfway through the experiment, the male experimenter would switch and you'd get this attractive female that they used for all of the participants. And apparently she was this very attractive undergraduate um, at UQ and they brought her out to the skateboard park at this particular moment where she would then suddenly take over running the experiment. The dependent variables included, um, they actually looked at that skateboarder's attempts at the easy or difficult trick and they looked at whether or not it was successful, whether the person crashed or whether they kind of like chickened out in the middle of it. They aborted their attempt at the particular um, trick. And they also measured their testosterone. They did this at the end of the study. They also asked them to do what's called a reversal learning task, which was a proxy for ventral medial prefrontal cortex functioning. That is, they couldn't actually put people in a scanner here. So instead, they gave them a little task that basically was done on a laptop where they had to make risky uh, decisions about blowing up a balloon. And if you blew it up too far on the balloon, you would make it pop and you would lose any tokens that you would want up until that point. And so the point is, if you're sort of a risk taker, you're not really showing much control over your risk taking ability here, you're gonna be making the balloon pop more and you're gonna end up with fewer tokens. 
all right? Now, why did they do this study? Interestingly, their study was done um, to test hypotheses that are derived from evolutionary biology. So they were talking about the fact that they thought that attractive women have the power to shift men's time perspective away from the long-term consequences of their choices and focus their attention on the here and now. So they have good reasons they outline in the beginning of that paper about why evolutionary biology would say this. But basically the idea is that if you're a young male, you're thinking about mating. And if you see this attractive woman, you're not really thinking about the long-term consequences of being injured. Instead, you're maybe focused on right now impressing her and taking bigger risks. And so they have a nice sort of a, um, theorizing about this in their paper. But the other thing to consider about this, besides the way that Ronay and Von Hippel think about it, is that the participants were actually young males, okay? And their mean age was 21.58. So they started with 18 year olds that they found at the park. And I noticed that if you kind of look at the age distribution, it looks like most of them are very young adult males. Um, I wonder if even some under 18 slipped into the study somehow by lying that they're 18. I mean, if you go to a skateboard park, I'm guessing that it's generally gonna be adolescents that are skateboarding there. You're not gonna find a lot of older 20 year olds and 30 year olds in there. But anyway, just keep in mind that the point is here that they're using fairly young males here who maybe have still developing prefrontal cortexes. So this could be considered then a study of late adolescence where the PFC isn't fully developed. In that case, then what we might expect is that the ventral striatum is still ruling more, right? It's, it's still not the case where the MPFC um, would have its sort of shutdown of ventral striatum motivation. So social rewards, including the attention of attractive females, might be appealing to this still developing young heterosexual male brain. And I noticed that I am going to say it's a heterosexual male brain because this is all working under the assumption that the reason why that attractive female has her effects is that these um, young males find her uh, sexually attractive. So if you take that just then as a test of late adolescence, I think that it doesn't say anything is wrong about the way Ronnie and Von Hippel did their study. It's just saying this is another interpretation of what you might expect to find here. All right, so here's what they actually found. Here's the results. And so what you can see is they've classified the early, the easy and the hard tricks, all right? And um, they're only looking here at the difficult tricks. So in block one and block two, they have the first 10 tricks and the second 10 tricks. So these are 10 difficult tricks and then second 10 difficult tricks. Some of these guys have a male experimer for both the first and the second blocks. You can see the little symbols there that up in the upper left, for instance, on aborted tricks, you can see that we get the same number of aborted tricks in the first 10 and the second 10 when there's a male experimenter. But notice that when we get to the second uh, kind of participant you have there, where they were assigned to a condition where a female experimenter is doing the second 10, that you can see that we get fewer aborted tricks. So that is when she is there looking at the second 10 tricks, these guys are performing for their difficult tr uh, tricks fewer abortish, aborted tricks. That is, they go through it, right? And in fact, what you see then over on the right is that what's going on is that in, when there's a attractive female there, they're actually making more failed tricks, okay? Also, if you look down at the final graph, you can see that they're making fewer successful tricks when they have a male experiment in the second 10, but they're making more successful tricks when there's a female present. So they're being riskier. That means they're getting more failed tricks, but they're also getting more successful tricks when that female experimenter is present compared to those participants who were randomly assigned to have the same male experimenter for all 20 tricks. I hope that's clear. I think it's a clever way of looking at behavior, just looking at these skateboarders and asking them to define what they thought was a difficult trick for themselves. Now, remember I told you that they measured reversal learning. They also measured testosterone. And one of the things they found was that there was a relationship here between the testosterone and the experimental manipulation of the gender of the experimenter. So you can see that, yes, there's this relationship between the experimenter's gender and aborted tricks that when she's present, they have fewer aborted tricks, right? So that's why there's a negative relationship there between one and the next. But this relationship was mediated by testosterone. And that finds, what we find there is that those participants who had the female do watch him for those final 10 tricks had increases in testosterone, which then caused them to have fewer aborted tricks. And so there was a causal pathway there where testosterone mediated the effect between the experimenter's gender and the aborted tricks.
So that's kind of clever. It's kind of an interesting way to show that their hypotheses were supported here that um, you know these males are really interested in the short term, their testosterone levels go up, and then as a result of that, that's why they make fewer aborted tricks. They go through with it, make more successes, more mistakes, but they they don't chicken out. So how do we interpret this? Well, obviously Rene and von Hippel thought this uh, supported their hypotheses. But a couple things to notice here, first of all, is that testosterone was only measured once at the end of the experiment. So we don't know if there were pre-existing differences in testosterone before the experimenter began. Um, so that is, it could have just been that maybe the guys who were in high testosterone are the ones that where the female uh, experimenter was assigned. I mean, it's unlikely since they used random assignment, but we just don't know because they didn't measure testosterone at the beginning of the study. We also don't know exactly what during the experiment caused their testosterone to go up. Was it the presence of the female? Was it just because they changed experimenters that caused their testosterone levels to go up? We don't know because all we have is really this sort of blunt measure of testosterone measured at the end. Now the reverse, the reversal learning task, I haven't mentioned that yet, but what they did find was that um, people were better at this task when they did it in front of the male experimenter than in front of the female experimenter. That is, they didn't blow up as many balloons and they ended up with more tokens when there was a male experimenter giving it to them versus when there was a female experimenter administering this task. And so when they did that, they were more likely to lose money. They were taking more risks popping up the balloon. But keep in mind, that's not the same thing as measuring ventral medial prefrontal cortex in the scanner. They want to use the reversal learning to try to say that this is all about ventral medial prefrontal cortex being shut down by an attractive female. And even if I want to try to say this is more about a poorly developed prefrontal cortex, I can't really say that from looking at reversal learning here only. It would have to also involve something to do with, um, you know, looking at a brain scan. Now, another thing finally to notice is that testosterone mediated the gender relationship to aborted tricks, but interestingly, reversal learning did not. So the key thing is that you're trying to say it has something to do with the way that they see this attractive female, that a reversal learning is actually what's causing the guy to take more risks, but they didn't actually find that what they did on the reversal learning mediated that relationship between the experimenter's gender and the, the number of aborted tricks that they did. And finally, just one more sort of interesting methodological issue is that they didn't actually measure the participants' um, sexual orientation. Um, it just assumes that all these participants were heterosexual, and so we don't know. Oh, and finally, I should just say one more thing. I, I still think this is sort of a problem too for the study is that no women were tested. And so we know, for instance, that young adolescent women or young adult women have um, are more likely to take risk when they have higher levels of estradiol, especially at different times of their menstrual cycle. So perhaps all of this would have worked the same if you had found women skateboarders doing this, um, and it would have been all related to something about elevated estradiol and risk-taking. But we don't know because no women were tested here, so um, it's just something to keep in mind as you think about the re results of this study.